This video is about unloaded Q measurements of surface mount resonators. Several years ago at IEEE IMS conference, I took a hands-on half-day course on low phase noise oscillator design where we built the oscillators in class and measured their phase noise. In that class, we measured the Q of our little surface mount resonators. These were surface mount inductors and capacitors soldered into a tank circuit. Uh, the unloaded Q of the uh, resonator is important because that contributes to the phase noise of the oscillator and you want to maximize that Q to lower the phase noise. Anyway, a neat method was shown on how to do this for measuring small parts. I don't know who taught the course, I can't remember, so I can't give attribution to who came up with this method, but I want to try to document it here because I can't find anything on like a Google image search on how to build these fixtures or how the method works. So I'm going to attempt to build one up and then measure it on the network analyzer and see if we can get a Q measurement out of it. In the original course, you use two small printed loops, you know, printed onto circuit boards. One loop was connected to port one on a network analyzer and port two was connected to loop two and you measured S21 of the analyzer and adjusted the two loops. The two loops were connected by a single screw so you could swivel them together and null out the uh, coupling between the loops and then put your resonator on there and then see the, uh, the bandwidth and the resonant frequency and calculate your unloaded Q from that. So I'm going to make up one of these uh, fixtures and try to explain how I think it works. So if you take two loops, uh, this loop right here, imagine if you take this loop, you've got a plus and a minus here where you feed it. Take this loop and, and swivel it over so you have a plus here and a minus right here. Uh, anyway, if you drive this thing, you're going to get current going around the loop. And of course, the magnetic field is going to be coming up out of the loop. And the adjacent loop, the field is going to be coming up into the air and then going back down through. Uh, so you're going to have weak coupling between the loops and it's going to be out of phase because again you've got the field coming up out of this loop and going down into the next one. So the coupling is going to be less than one, greater than zero but less than one, and it's going to be out of phase. Now imagine if you took this loop right here and slid it over the driving loop so they're fully, uh, the areas are fully you know, enclosed on one another. You're going to have very strong coupling and since the driving loop, you know, the magnetic field is coming up out of the page, it's going through, you know, the perfectly aligned second loop. So you're going to have very strong coupling, you know, just say it's close to one, but the coupling is going to be in phase. So if you take the second loop and just slide it partially over the first loop, again, you've got this weak coupling coming up out and going back in that's out of phase, and the strong coupling where they're overlapped is in phase. You should be able to find a point that overlaps where the weak coupling and the strong coupling, since they're anti-phase from one another, uh, will cancel out, and you should get a coupling coefficient of zero. So it's difficult to measure these surface mount resonators because their uh, fields are confined to, you know, uh, very close to the, the part itself. But if you have these two loops where the coupling is nulled, you can get very good isolation. So it stands to reason, again, that if you put a resonator somewhere within this loop and the coupling is nulled out, it's going to perturb the fields in there. And you should be able to see the uh, resonance that you normally couldn't see when you have these things either strongly coupled or loosely coupled. And uh, I've drawn a little plot down here, kind of emulating S21 on the analyzer. You've got this uh, floor right here, which is your, your uh, nulled out uh, floor of the analyzer. Normally it would be up here for strong coupling and then weak coupling somewhere over here. But if you null this out, you can get it all the way down to a very low level and then put the resonator in there and it's gonna perturb the fields and you're gonna see the uh, center frequency and the bandwidth and of course for for resonators that are loosely coupled, and by that I mean uh, where the coupling you know, is under 30 dB or so, the unloaded Q of that resonator is simply the resonant frequency divided by the bandwidth. And I should have drawn a little uh, minus sign right here, so that coupling is going to be under negative 30 dB in the uh, S21 response. So the question is how big to make this loop. If the loop gets too big, it's going to act like an antenna. If it gets too small, we're not going to generate a very strong field. So we want to maximize the area of this loop without it self-resonating. You can do this if you keep the electrical length of the loop 
uh, a quarter wavelength or under, if you go back and look at the circuit theory, it says that, uh, you know, as a transmission line approaches a quarter wavelength, it, the tangent of that, of the electrical length, you, know, you can approximate the inductive reactance from that. So you can make these loop looks like, look like inductors if you keep them under a quarter electrical wavelength. So if you look at the 2 pi r, this is the circumference of the loop. We want to keep that to under one quarter electrical wavelength. And of course, the electrical wavelength is the speed of light divided by the operating frequency and the square root of the dielectric constant in a medium. This is going to be on a circuit board, so it's going to be somewhere between the circuit board's dielectric constant and the dielectric constant of air, which is one relative dielectric constant. So I've got plenty of the 5880 Dorori, the Rogers material, 60 mils thick. That has a dielectric constant of 2.2 and a very low loss tangent. So the dielectric constant that the line sees is going to be somewhere between 1 and 2.2. We choose a radius of 10 millimeters for the loop. That turns out to be a quarter wavelength frequency, electrical wavelength of 1.19 gigahertz. If you take and divide that by the square root of 1.4, you end up with 1 gigahertz. And that 1.4 is, is somewhere, you know, between 1 and the 2.2 of the material. So this kind of puts an upper bound on the operating frequency of this uh, loop right here. There are other things that are going to affect the loop. Uh, you're going to have, you know, a capacitive coupling from the loop across itself, you're going to have coupling in the feed right here. So the resonant frequency is going to get lower, but we're primarily interested in stuff in the VHF and UHF, UHF range for this. So uh, we're going to be able to get this thing up to 1 gigahertz or maybe a little bit lower depending on the self-capacitance of the loop. So I'm going to use Microwave Office to lay out this loop and simulate it to try to predict the coupling and show the nulling before we build the thing. Uh, this is my, the PCB stack up and the global definitions again. Uh, if you looked at some of my previous videos, I'll show the stack up right here. So this is going to be 5880 Doroid, uh, 1.575 millimeters thick, 35 micron copper. That's one ounce copper, 60 mils thick, with a dielectric constant of 2.2 and a loss tangent of about 0 0.001. Normally, since these are going to be two loops, each on a single layer circuit board, you could simulate everything on with a single layer of circuit board. But since we're going to be flipping one loop over, and I'm going to be using Axiom 2.5D simulator, I'm going to do some tricks here to uh, make that simulate and only have to draw one sub-circuit to do it. Uh, if I was using Analyst, I wouldn't need to do this because I can arbitrarily uh, rotate shapes in 3D, but in 2D, I'm going to do a couple tricks to make it easy to simulate. So I'm going to end up defining my whole stack up in Microwave Office as a three-layer stack up instead of a single layer stack up, or two layer, two metal layers, one single dielectric layer is what I mean by a two-layer stack up versus a three-layer stack would, would be three metal layers. Now going up and looking at the drawing layers, uh, I've defined a copper plus and a copper minus. Again, from my previous videos, the copper minus is subtracted from copper plus and then that result is put onto copper. And I've done the same for a copper two and copper three layers. And then also, there's the board layer, which is normally in microwave office, but I've added a board two also with the associated plus and minus layers. And then the notes layer, where I'm going to put my notes for the circuit board that I uh, draw up. Now, going and looking at the 3D drawing layers, again, this doesn't have anything to do with the simulation, but it's, it's good for visualization. My copper is going to start at a Z position to zero and 35 microns thick. Same for copper plus and minus. Copper 2 is going to start at the bottom of the circuit board, so minus 1.575 millimeters with a negative thickness of 35 microns. Then copper 3 is going to be two layers of substrate deep, so minus 1.3, minus 3.15 millimeters, again with a 35 micron depth. And then board is going to be starting at zero with a minus 1.575 thickness, and then Board 2 is going to start at minus 1.575 with a thickness of minus 1.575, and that's what gets us the minus 3.15. So I'm going to use Axiom to do a simulation of a single loop. 
then I'll use analyst to do a simulation of a single loop and two coupled loops and I'll also use analyst excuse me axiom to do a simulation of two coupled loops so this axiom stack up is going to be a uh, two metal layer stack up and the axiom stack up over here will be a three metal layer stack up looking at the stack up for the uh, two metal layer you can see my material definitions right here, the variables I've defined right here. Dielectric layers, uh, 1.575 millimeters for the core, and the air above it between the core and the boundary conditions on the top and bottom, which are opens, is going to be 25 millimeters. So for antennas, you want to keep this a quarter wavelength away, your boundary condition from your, from your element. Uh, you want to keep it out of the reactive near field, which is you know dies off at a quarter wavelength typically. We're not worried about far field radiation here, so um, we want to keep this rather close in because we're going to be going low in frequency down to 100 megahertz or so or lower. At 100 megahertz, a quarter wavelength away is 300 millimeters. You could do that in Axiom since it's not meshing that air in there, but when you go to do this in Analyst, it's going to have to mesh that air, so you want to be able to keep these uh, boundary conditions rather close when we're going lower in frequency. So if you think this is an issue, you could always simulate it, then move the boundary conditions away. It's going to take longer, and but see if there's any difference in your results. So, But since we're worried about near-field coupling, we're not worried about far-field, we'll keep this at 25 millimeters, which is about a quarter wavelength at 3 gigahertz. Now, uh, look at the materials. Uh, I've got my one ounce copper, positive and negative and half ounce positive and negative. And you can see how defined this is 35 microns thick for the positive, negative 35 microns for the uh, uh, one ounce copper that will be on the bottom of the board. And the core of, of minus one thickness, this doesn't pertain to axiom, but this will be used in analyst. In EM layer mapping, uh, copper two, of course, goes on top excuse me, copper goes on top, copper two goes on the bottom. You can see that, you know, it's got that negative thickness that I defined earlier. And then via goes down through the board. And these don't matter. And then uh, simplification rules, uh, I will talk about those later when I actually do the simulation. Now looking at the uh, stack up, three layer stack up for Axiom. Uh, same as before, but now I've added an extra layer of uh, core material in here same boundary conditions and EM layer mapping you can see that I've got that top layer in the inside layer I've got it going down negative and this is will be will, shouldn't be too much of an error uh, these boards are going to be obviously overlapping but the the metal is not going down into the dielectric it's going to be sitting in a very thin air layer but for simplification purposes we're just going to assume that it's going to go down into the dielectric of course the copper three on the bottom is going to go into the air and uh, other than that, everything else is the same as the previous uh, definition for the single layer, excuse me, two middle layer stack up. What I forgot to mention when looking at the stack up back here is the, uh, you can see I've got these EM layer mappings. I've got Axiom, I've got Axiom 3 layer and the Analyst 3 layer. Now look at the Analyst stack up. Uh, same material definition, same uh, dielectric thickness as the Axiom three-layer stack up, but instead of the core material, I'm using air because these dielectrics are going to be extruded when it's simulated in Analyst. And look at the EM layer mappings. These are all the same as the three-layer Axiom stack up, but going down to the board now. Uh, so the board is going to take the shape on the board layer, and it's a via which means it starts at layer two and goes down by one layer and the material is made out of the uh, core substrate. And that's why I defined a material previously of core sub. I just gave it a dummy thickness of negative one. But now all the, the board and the board two, board two is a layer, but starting on this second layer right here and going down by one ending up on the bottom. So it's gonna take this board and this board two and extrude dielectrics from it. Now, a quick tip is that you can go up here when creating these different layer uh, EM layer mappings. It's kind of easy to just go ahead and define one of them. Go into say the Axiom one, 
and then go ahead and, and uh, copy that. You can say copy and it will create a new one. Then you can go back and rename that and change it. That's a quick way of, of creating different layer mappings. Then go back into your stack ups and, and select the proper ones that you want to use. So I've got a uh, basic loop element right here that I've drawn. Uh, it's the, the schematic layout name is loop. Um, I've drawn this out of microstrip elements. There's several ways of doing this. You could use microstrip elements. You could use an artwork cell to do the loop, parameterized artwork cell. You could use uh, uh, polygons in here and put shape modifiers on the polygons and do Boolean subtractions to try to draw a loop from two circles. So uh, there's probably no right way, no wrong way, but uh, I try to do the easiest way, I think, is using uh, microstrip elements for this. So I've got a microstrip curve right here. I've got three of them. Actually, yeah, three of them right here with a width of one millimeter. One millimeter seems to be about a decent line width for this. If you get it too, too wide, uh, obviously we're probably going to have a lower loss if it's wider, but we're not too worried about the loss right here. We don't want to get it too thick, again, because we're going to have very weak coupling. So uh, one millimeter seems to be about a decent width. Uh, I've set the radius to 10 millimeters. Uh, so it'll be centered about right here. I've got these three sections of 90 degree microstrip curves. And then I've defined a microstrip line right here that will snap on to the curve right here. Uh, one trick on doing this is you have to go into shape properties and you have to tell this face to be offset. Normally this curve is going to, these two faces are going to be right up against one another uh, flat together. But in order to get this to snap upwards, you have to go and you have to tell it to do an angle of a uh, negative 90 degree offset. All, all the other loops can snap flat together, but this one you have to do and uh, into that shape properties to get that to go properly. Anyway, I've got, starting off with this microstrip line right here, this is 0 comma 0 on the layout. I go over with a length of 7. Then I snap these three lines together. Then I have another ending line right here, which is almost, which is in parallel with it, but two millimeters uh, shorter, five versus seven. And then I've got this trace element right here, and I've got this curve right here. This curve is a width of one and a radius of 10, but it's got an angle of 70 degrees. So what I've done is I need to adjust this angle I, it can't be 90. If it was going to be at 90, it would come up right to about there. So I want to make it shorter than 90. I need to make it long enough that it gets very close to this trace I want to connect to right here. But I don't want to make it too short because I want to pro try to preserve most of this uh, circular sec circle right here. So uh, making this about 70 degrees and then snapping on a microstrip trace element, M MC trace element, that allows you to arbitrarily draw your uh, microstrip line and you can see that there's about there's a limit on what it can the angle that it can draw right here so adjusting this to 70 degrees and to get this to snap cleanly uh, that's kind of what was the key in, in getting this thing drawn let me undo that right now but you can see I've still got some uh, red marks which says they're not exactly snapped together but if I go back and do a snap all in the geometry that should uh should clean up. What I've done right here also is manually drawn this little segment right here. I drew a circle and then uh, did a slicing tool to, to get this drawn. And this will just add a little bit of a curve right here. So I'm going to use one of these little edge mount SMA connectors. I bought a bag of these things off eBay. They're not very good quality uh, compared to say the, the Johnson and the Amphenol ones, but they'll work. They're a little bit thicker than uh, the, the gap right here is a little bit thicker than the 62,000s board. It's probably about 65,000s, but you can have solder on there and the tabs will connect onto the bottom and top just fine. So what I've done for the pads on the top layer, if I turn off copper 2, I've drawn a just a solid uh, wide polygon of, of copper positive. And I've taken, given this microstrip line, a line type right here of top CPWG. So that is going to create kind of a coplanar punch through of this top copper right here, the top copper uh, 
positive. The top copper negative is going to subtract from that and uh, generate a, a cutout right here. We kind of want to make this a little bit wide right here. We don't want too much capacitance from the center trace to ground because that's going to lower the self-resonant frequency of the loop. So uh, I'm going to try to keep that wide. I've gone into uh, look at the text edit process definition for the layout process file. I've taken this top copper line type and copied it over and called it top CPWG and get an offset, the copper minus of one millimeter from the copper. So it's going to take and draw that standard microstrip element, but offset a trace that's one millimeter wider on either side onto the copper minus layer and uh, create that. And uh, I assign that line type right here. Now on the board layer, I've drawn the profile for the dielectric. And that's a length of uh, 34 millimeters by about uh, so 42 millimeters. But this, I've drawn the shape on the board positive layer. Then I've gone and drawn a polygon on the board negative layer. And then these two circles right here. And then I'm not going to end up merging them together. But this is going to form a slot for the screws to go through. So this board is going to sit on top a mating board, which is going to be its duplicate. And it's going to have a slot on the top and the bottom above the loop. And uh, screws are going to go through there. So you're going to be able to slide this thing back and forth on top of one another. And this notch right here is going to allow it to clear its mate's connector, which is right here. If I open up the 3D view, you can see what this is going to look like. I'll have the uh, edge, edge mount connector right here. And I have copper 2 turned off. That's why it's not showing up now. You can see the solder pads right here. And then the mating connector, the clearance for that is going to be uh, right here. So in order to simulate two loops and only draw one set of artwork, what I've done is taken this, uh, the original loop, and I've instantiated it inside another circuit called LoopMate 2D. So if I click on this sub-circuit, you can see the whole thing lights up. But what I've done is gone ahead and done a shape preprocessor, SPPM. And what I've told it to do is take, take and preprocess the board plus and board minus to merge it onto board and do the same thing with copper plus and copper minus. So do the standard copper positive and negative layer processing for top and bottom and, and do the board. And then I'm going to shift this around. I'm going to take, I'm going to replace copper with copper three. So I'm going to take the stuff that was on the copper top layer and I'm going to shift it down by two layers down to a copper three layer. That will emulate sort of it being mirrored around and flipped on its axis. Then I'm going to take that board layer. I'm going to move, shift it down to a board two layer. So you can imagine taking one of these, these uh, circuit boards and flipping it about the X axis. So you will have end up with a board on top of one another when you go to simulate this. What I've also done is taken this sub circuit and flipped it about its X axis. Uh, that's to emulate uh, mirroring the thing onto the bottom. So if I go back to the original loop and look at its layout, you'll see that the ground was on the bottom side of the, or below the uh, uh, center pin right here. But looking here, now it's above the center pin. If I go back and look at that layout in 3D, you'll see this is the, looking from the top, this is the, uh, the, the solder pads for the bottom side. And then the, the, below that, you're going to have the, the loop right here. If I go back and look at the original loops 3D layout, let's just close this stuff and get both of these tiled together. You can see this loop right here and then the mating loop is going to go like that. So this board is going to sit on top of one another. So what I've done is I've created a schematic called coupled loops and within that schematic I've got the original loop and then the uh, loop mate 2D which is the one I just showed that was uh, uh, had its geometry layers uh, moved and uh, mirrored around the x-axis. So I've instantiated that loop, uh, the original loop to the right here and then the mating loop to the left. I'm doing this so I can uh, uh, do the parameterized artwork, the port assignment, a little bit easier when I go into the EM simulator. But anyway, I've defined a point of zero overlap to be where these two microstrips are essentially overlapped right here at the center perfectly. 
and then uh, I've assigned a uh, shape modifier starting you know with a lock point right here with a, uh, where it starts and then uh, the other point right here so I can change and control the overlap of these two loops and the distance was 54 millimeters so I'm going to assign a variable called loop overlap so now if I take and say change this to 5 these two loops go together right here and start to overlap when I look at the 3D view and go window tile vertical now I can start changing this loop overlap if I go to overlap of 20 that should get a full overlap yes and it does you can see why I've got this clearance now so the connector uh, legs will not contact the circuit board and again screw nylon screws are going to go down through here and tighten so this thing can slide uh, back and forth and go back to zero here and the, the point of of uh, nulling you know maybe around somewhere like uh, a value of four or so where they're you know overlap slightly but this is parameterized now so I can pass this sub circuit up to the EM simulator when I instantiate in there I'm going to be able to change this overlap and uh, run multiple EM simulations for different overlaps and look at the value of the coupling now again the whole reason why I did this three layer metal stack up was specifically to simulate this stuff in Axiom if I were doing an analyst you know analyst is a 3D solver it has a concept of a uh, it allows you to flip things over, mirror stuff, rotate stuff arbitrarily in 3D space. With Analyst, you know, you're kind of stuck on these infinite layers. So I had to take and draw that mating layer and transfer that down to a copper 2 and a copper 3 instead of being able to just keep everything on these copper layers right here. If I didn't want to do that, I would have had to take and drawn, uh, manually drawn this thing. So it's easier just to do this little trick with the three layers and do the mirroring and uh, get it to simulate an axiom. And I can go ahead and do use the exact same uh, model in uh, Analyst instead of having to, to manually uh, rotate stuff in 3D. So what I've done is created a new EM structure called Single Loop Axiom Test Bench. I've instantiated the single loop because uh, I want to look at check this loop for self resonances. Uh, by itself sitting out in free space. When I did that, it created the copied the subs two stack up that I had in my global definitions with everything already in there. Uh, so since I drew the uh, original artwork with microstrip elements, these ports will automatically stay snapped on to the uh, sub circuit. Even if I move that sub circuit, they'll stay on there. I've assigned edge ports to here and I've set the type to none. So it doesn't have a ground reference. The ground reference is actually at infinity. Then I've added another port and called that port negative one. So this is going to be uh, edge ports differential. So the current's going to uh, come in here and then go back out to infinity and then come back again, essentially. So you've got essentially a differential port right here. I've also went ahead and meshed it. And you can see the meshing looks pretty. Uh, it's, it's fine enough. Again, we're not we're not, uh, this is going to be pretty low in frequency, so I'm not too worried about getting a super good edge mesh on here since uh, we're going to be running at a frequency the currents are going to be more confined to the center than really at the edges, but uh, this is ready for simulation now. I've also got this uh, shape preprocessor modifier right here where uh, I take and delete the board layers because, again, Axiom is a infinite substrate uh, it doesn't you don't actually draw the board on there the substrate inference so I'm going to delete those and then I subtracting the copper minus from copper plus and also doing that for the copper two to pre-process it before it goes into the simulator so I've done the same thing I've in analyst now I've created a single loop analyst test bench it brought in the sub three stack up that I had in there uh, and I've drawn the boundary conditions. Now in the analyst, we've got, since we're on a finite substrate, we're going to draw the substrate. It's going to draw the substrate. And the boundary conditions I've set for uh, 25 millimeters away also. And I've got the shape preprocessor modifier right here. If I go and look at that, you can see I am only merging the positive and minus on the copper layers and the board. I'm not doing 
the dilution of the board since the board is going to be drawn on those via material layers it needs to be in there and by mesh it you can see it's meshing this meshing the dielectric of the board now it's meshing the air but that's not being shown that's hidden it's also uh, meshing the uh, surface what I did need to do is has a little bit of difficulty meshing it so I need to turn off this substitute true arc that's going to put uh, facets on the edge right here instead of trying to draw an actual arc segment. I've also set the port types to LUP differential in Analyst and I've got the, the negative port also right here. So I've simulated this in both Axiom and Analyst and you can see the results are pretty much right on top of one another. I'm simulating from 50 megahertz up to 1 gigahertz and uh, the locus is staying on the outside of the upper half of the Smith chart, so it is definitely an inductor, and there are no signs of self-resonance. If you did see a self-resonance, it would curl in and uh, lower in impedance, and that would probably be a sign of radiation. So now that I know the loop is uh, has no self has no resonances up to, to a gigahertz, I've created a new axiom test bench called coupled loops axiom. I've instantiated that coupled loop schematic inside of there and you can see that the uh, parameter now, the over loop overlap is exposed. So I can take that parameter and assign it a variable called loop overlap and then sweep that variable from certain values. I can, in fact here I'm doing it from 0 to 20. I'll, in a second I'll get to why I've broken out these step values to finer sweeps. But uh, essentially going to sweep it from 0 to 20 millimeters and look at the coupling. Now previously I had mentioned why I had taken that original loop element and put that on the right hand side of the circuit and then taken my mirrored element and put that on the left hand side because when I move these when I move this uh, the second element right here it's going to move left and right since these were drawn as microstrips the ports the EM ports are staying snapped to these elements right here when I have my loop mate 2D you know, this one right here where I took and uh, flipped the geometry over and copied it. Uh, it's going to take all those microstrip elements and convert them to essentially dumb polygons. So when I instantiate that down into the circuit and bring it up to the up in a hierarchy to the simulator, it comes out as dumb polygons, so I can't draw these ports directly on these polygons. I need to draw a polygon within the EM structure and then assign a port to that. And if I were to try to do that on the right hand side, the subcircuit would move, you know, its displacement, but these poly dumb polygons in the EM structure would stay fixed. So my ports would not move with the geometry. So for that reason, I've taken and uh, drawn that manually. If I had drawn the mating counterpart, you know, totally redrawn it as a mirrored element and it had true microstrip uh, elements in there, then it would stay snapped. So this is a trick you got to do to keep everything snapped together. So now I'm going to simulate this and let's see how fast it simulates. You can see the geometry moving right here and now it's going to kick off. Uh, let's see how many is it going to kick off? About 20, uh, looks like 24, 25 simulations. Uh, it's moving along pretty quick. And this is the reason why you would do this in Axiom initially because we want to try to find the optimum offset, you know, to, to null the coupling. If you were to do this in Analyst, it would take a lot longer. Uh, it, it may be more accurate for what we're doing, not necessarily so, but it's definitely going to take longer. You can see how fast this is going right here. It's about halfway done already. Uh, and then after this is finished, I'll be able to plot this for every uh, loop offset. And it is finished. And for those 25 simulations, oops, you can see it probably took about 45 seconds. I lost. I didn't have the checkbox that said keep keep uh, open when the simulation was done. So now I can look at the results. Uh, it's going to throw all the curves on top of one another. If I look at a loop overlap of zero, you can see it's about uh, 31 negative 31 dB a coupling, and then. As the loop steps, let's go to loop overlap of 1 while the coupling is decreasing. And we go down to loop overlap of 6. You can see that moderate loop overlaps are down in this region. Uh, 4.0 millimeters 
provides the least amount of coupling, but now you can see that a 20 millimeter overlap has the most coupling right here. So we're going to get this plot in a little bit better representation so we can find the, the optimum uh, offset to minimize the coupling. Now I've created a new graph called coupling versus loop overlap using Axiom. And what I've done, I've chosen a fixed frequency of 150 megahertz. And for the X axis, I told it to use a sweep variable, which is the offset. So now you can see that uh, it's starting with a loop overlap of zero and going up to 20. And we're seeing a null at a loop overlap of 4.25. And that is a pretty sharp null. We're never going to get that in reality. But you can see it's minus 93 dB of coupling. So trying to narrow down that, that coupling point, try to find it, what I've done is instead of just doing a sweep variable, say in steps of one, I've defined this thing into three different segments. I've got the lower segment is stepped from zero to three in increments of one, then upper from six to 20 in increments of two. So a coarser sweep as we go up here, but then a middle uh, going from 3.25 up to 6 with increments of 0 0.25. So that's going to give me finer steps in this region right here and coarse steps here and even coarser steps out here. Uh, and then I take and concatenate the lower and the middle together and then concatenate that onto the upper and generate one big vector of sweep values which is fed to the sweep variable. And you can see that this, uh, so I've set the loop overlap to 4.75 where the null is. You can see about which, uh, where it gives the, uh, gives the minimum coupling. Now I've gone back to that original uh, graph that had all the curves on top of one another. I've only selected the 4.25 millimeter offset. And you can see that at 150 megahertz, it's down, uh, if you look at the minus 92.8, at uh, 150, you go over 150 on here and you're minus 92.8 approximately. But you can see now for that fixed offset, we're sweeping frequency and we're maintaining uh, 80 dB or better, you know, isolation between the two over this frequency range. In reality, you're never going to get this, you know, but, uh, but it shows that it's rather a uh, broad band. It's not, it's not limited to like one little uh, resonance. The broad bandedness kind of indicates that it's a uh, solely due to magnetic field, and of course, there's no uh, resonances in there either. So it'll be interesting to see how this works when we build the loop up. Now, I've neglected a lot of things. I haven't, you know, put the SMA connectors on there. So this thing is being ideally fed with a perfect uh, differential drive. So uh, it'll be interesting to see how this thing works out when it's actually fabricated and measured. Now I've gone back and run the same analysis with the uh, stepped offset in Analyst. And you can see that the peak now is at 3.75 millimeters offset versus the 4.25 millimeters offset that I found in Axiom. Uh, the big difference though is, uh, and I, I went back and re-simulated the Axiom and it took 2.3 seconds per point for 53 seconds total for the 23 point sweep. In Analyst, 72 seconds per point, so 27 minutes total. So, and got close to the same answer. Um, but you can see why you'd want to start doing stuff initially in, in uh, 2.5D because it's a hell of a lot faster, uh, uh, about almost 30 fold faster versus uh, the full 3D. So do it in uh, you do it in 2.5D, and then you know once you kind of know where the range where you're at, I could have just gone back and just looked at that middle segment that I defined right around the resonance and swept it there and probably gotten this in about 10 minutes, but it shows the speed difference between the two. Now uh, you can also see that while the uh, isolation is as much as shown in Axiom the analyst results still show sort of a broadband response here, just not as uh, quite good of isolation. So now I've gone and created another schematic called uh, uh, CPLR0 for coupled loop uh, revision zero. In that I've placed the loop element and then I've gone ahead and added some uh, notes right here so you can see uh, the title and then 
defining one ounce copper for the top surface, one ounce for the bottom, and my 1.575 millimeter uh, 5880 core material, and then uh, specifying there are no uh, no vias, at least no plated vias in this thing. We're going to have these slots right here and no edge relief. The router is going to come right up against the copper and cut it. Normally in a board I've had fabricated at a fab shop, I'll leave 0.2 millimeters of edge relief from the edge of the board to the edge of the metal. But in this, uh, I'm just going to cut the thing on my router here at home. So uh, I don't need to worry about that edge relief. And these Gerbers are ready to export now. So here's the uh, finished board off the router. See, they're stacked on top of one another, and you can slide them apart. I've got these wing nuts, nylon wing nuts, and uh, screws in there. And uh, slides apart pretty easily. The uh, 5880 is pretty smooth. This one's undercut a little bit, again, because of uh, setting the router depth. If you go look at my last video on cutting the inverted F antenna, it kind of gives some details on how to do the router. But all in all, it turned out pretty good. So this thing's ready to... Uh, be hooked up to the network analyzer to try to uh, measure some uh, components. So I've got this on the network analyzer now. The analyzer is running from 300 kilohertz to 1 gigahertz looking at a magnitude of S21. Uh, port 1 is here, port 2 is here. I've got an SMA uh, barrel on right here. So look at the coupling. You can see I've got a marker at 150 megahertz. It's uh, minus 10 dB for S21. Now if I start pulling this thing apart you can see the coupling is going down and we get a dip right there. That dip is probably close. And you can see it's gone from, from negative 10 down to negative 64 approximately. That dip, this is with the thing fully uh, pulled apart so the loops are, you know, right at the zero offset. So if I pull this in just a little bit, which is probably close to that that approximately four millimeters predicted by the simulation, you can see the null. The problem is, is that the simulation predicted that the null should be very broad band. It looks like it is highly frequency dependent. So we're getting a lot more coupling at the higher frequencies. So this thing seems to only really work about probably 300 megahertz and below. Uh, the simulation showed that up at one gigahertz, we should still have very good, uh, you know, nulling effect, but we're not getting that. But we'll go ahead and try to uh, do some measurements here at the lower uh, UHF and VHF. So, but it, it looks like, you know, we can, we are getting that nulling effect by changing the, uh, the loop uh, offset. Now I should mention the VNA is not calibrated right now, but it really doesn't need to be because we're looking at magnitude. It's got a calibration essentially at the factory that are referenced back to the end connectors on the analyzer. But we're looking at kind of a uh, uh, relative measurement right here. And if I pull the connectors off, you'll see, pull the fixture off, the isolation will get down, the measurement will get down to like minus 80 dB. So it's got enough inherent isolation, even uncalibrated, to... Uh, uh, do this measurement. So as a test resonator, what I've done, I've got a 0805 inductor soldered onto a 0603 capacitor, and we're going to try to measure the uh, resonant frequency and the Q of this resonator. So the capacitor is an ATC 600S 27 picofarad, uh, again 0603 size. It's got a Q of approximately 200. If I go over to the data sheet for the part, uh, 27 picofarad is about right here. And we go up to about 450 megahertz, which will actually probably be a little bit higher. But if you look at 30, 30 picofarad and 450 megahertz, that gives us a Q of 200. So it'll probably actually be a little bit higher. But in the end, the low Q of the inductor is going to swamp the capacitor. So getting this uh, as accurate isn't, isn't that much of a uh, deal. Now the inductor is a Coilcraft 0805 CS. It's 27 nanohenry, again 0805 case size, and it will have a Q of about 55. If I go and look at the uh, data sheet here for the uh, 27 nanohenry, it's got a Q of 55 at 500 megahertz. If you look at the graph for the 0805 series, let's pick one uh, 22 nanohenry. That's pretty close. Follow this. Uh, curve down to 
uh, about right here, and you can see it's got a Q of about 45 near 200 megahertz. So this is going to, if you look at the, the uh, uh, resin frequency, it should be approximately 186 megahertz, but if you take the, uh, the Q of these, are going to add in parallel since you're adding essentially resistors in parallel. The, the uh, lowest value is going to uh, set your Q. So, uh, you know, 1 over 200 from the capacitor and 1 over 55 from the inductor, and I'm going off that, the uh, data table right here, gives us a Q for the resonator. It should be around 41 or so. So now if I take the uh, resonator and I put it on the loop, you can see it really doesn't change anything until I, it's going to be kind of hard to do this without a microscope. If I take and flip it on its end so the magnetic fields from the loop and the resonator are aligning, then you can see the resonance pop up right here. And it looks like that's, you know, the marker's at 150, so it's slightly above that. So now if I take and move this thing to adjust the coupling, we want to try to get the coupling right where the resonator is. See if we can get that adjusted. There we go, about right there. Now I'm going to take the resonator off, put it on the side there, and store this into memory. So data to memory, and then memory on off. Now I'm going to put the resonator back on there so you can see the difference between with and without the resonator. So we get that nice sharp uh, little resonance inside of there. And I've obviously flipped that off to the side goes away because the fields aren't aligned, magnetic fields not aligned. So what I've done now is narrowed the analyzer span down to sweep from 170 megahertz to 200. And I've thrown a reference marker here at the uh, peak of the resonance, which was about 184 megahertz, and then uh, thrown a delta marker on the left and right hand sides and I want to be 3 dB down with those delta markers so you can see that marker 1 is 2.07, 2.08 megahertz below the reference and uh, marker 2 is 2.25 above that so looking at the bandwidth between marker 1 and marker 2 and then the resonant frequency we can calculate the Q of the resonator. So now if you do that calculation using those numbers uh, resonant frequency divided by the 3 dB bandwidth you end up with a Q of unloaded Q of 42.5, and that's pretty close to the Q of uh, 41 that was predicted off the data sheet value. So this circuit is pretty handy for uh, uh, measuring these small devices. You can see the device is much smaller than the loop. Uh, the, the total area is probably encompassed by the overlap is probably about right in there. But uh, I just I think it's pretty cool that you can take and uh, you know move that off right there. I've got averaging turned on so you'll see and you'll see the uh, uh, see the resonance go away if I turn averaging off. Let's see uh, where is it? Go up here. Now you can see the trace got noisier but you can move this around kind of in uh, real time and see the see the result. We're back to resonance now. If I take and move this, you'll see you can't pick up the resonance when you're, except when you know this thing. So that's why it's kind of important to be able to uh, have this adjustable fixture to create the null. Now the problem is, is that it's not working all the way up to one gigahertz, and uh, uh, that is actually due. And I, I, I'll show in simulation what is uh, causing that. So if I take and pull the loops all the way apart, uh, one uh, uh, key indicator of uh, the issue is that uh, strong mo common mode currents on the outside of this coax, if I take and if you look at the response up at the end of the uh, frequency sweep at gigahertz, as I run my fingers along this coax, in fact I run it all the way back about 12 inches back, I'm getting some pretty strong currents, you know. If we're just coupling with magnetic fields around the loop area, this shouldn't matter, but uh, there are definitely fields radiating off of the coax and likely coupling over to one another, forming kind of like a dipole, you know, between, between both uh, pieces of the coax. 
So I've gone back in a microwave office and copied my uh, original coupled loops analyst test bench and create a new one called coupled loops coax analyst test bench. I've gone in and added the uh, from the 3D EM libraries. I've added a coaxial line right here, coax 3D, and drop those in there. And then I've taken and uh, modified the dimensions of this to approximate the RG405, otherwise known as 086 hand formable coax. So I like really like the 086 and 141 and 047 uh, hand formable coax. It's very easy to terminate. Uh, anyway, this will fit nicely. You know, it's, you can see it's sized about the proper dimensions to fit uh, on the loop. I remove these SMA connectors and solder the coax in place. It would uh, fit nicely. Also, notice on the network analyzer now that the fixture is not hooked up, the isolation is down below 80 dB. Anyway, I've added the coax in for the uh, 086 hand formable, and uh, this is again 50 ohm coax. Uh, if I go and look here, I've set up, I've extended this coax about 50 millimeters from the edges of the uh, board, and this is set, the offset between the loops is uh, 3.75 millimeters, so that's what analysts found for the peak, uh, the peak isolation. So I've added 50 millimeters length of coax on either side of here, and I've added these, and it's easier to see in the 3D view, I've gone in and uh, if you look how the coax comes into the board, I've added a little bit of metal right here to make the outer jacket of the coax transition on to the, uh, well this side is ground, this side is kind of floating right here, but I've added that right here and I've done it on the other side also to get these uh, ground connections. So I'm going to simulate this now and see what happens to the isolation. So the simulation uh, shows the blue line right here is the original uh, simulation without the coax and the coupling was around minus 50 dB, but now adding the coax in, the coupling reduces to almost minus 30, so pretty poor. And that's about what was measured on the network analyzer, right about uh, 30, you know, uh, at uh, UHF and uh, up here. So looking at the uh, 3D uh, surface currents now, these are the currents at 1 gigahertz. You can see the uh, first loop right here is being driven. Uh, the second loop uh, is, is just terminated at the end of the coax. But zooming in on here and looking, this is a 60 dB range on the plot scale. Um, you can see that quite a bit of uh, currents excited on the outside of the coax. So these common mode currents are being excited on the outside. What, what's happening is that you know, as you're injecting current in this loop, it wants to pull it, you know, on this side, and ideally it would pull it from the interior of the outer jacket, but that's not what's happening. It's also, you know, you've got free charge on the outside of this coax, so it's yanking it from the outside also, inducing surface currents on here. Those currents are going to radiate and couple over, you know, like a dipole to the other one. So, uh, in fact, we can see right here that the currents are lower, but you can see in the animation it's still showing up. So what we need to be able to do is choke off these currents to try to, for, you know, essentially make a ballon, you know, and force these currents so they onto the interior of the uh, outer conductor. So a quick way of uh, solving this problem is to put ferrite beads around the outside of the exterior of the coax to choke off those common mode currents that are flowing on the outside. Uh, the other way is to, you know, wind it in a coil that will turn that outside into an inductor and try to choke those off. Another way to possibly just to take and make the, uh, the two uh, coaxes orthogonal so they don't couple. Uh, so uh, I'm looking at Ferrite's website. The num I use the number 61 material ton. It's got a, a broad bandwidth here. Uh, looking at the initial permeability of 125 for relative uh, permeability. Uh, Knowing this number, we can take and create a ferrite bead model in the 3D simulator. Of course, this is probably going to be very frequency dependent. It's best to, to try to take and measure this. Maybe once you measure it, you could find out equivalent surface impedance that you could assign to this material. But uh, And it, it's lossy, but that's actually fine. You know, if this were an antenna and we choked off currents or tried to make a balance of this, uh, that would add a uh, loss to the antenna we don't want that but on here we don't care because i'm using it 
for uh, isolation. And if that those currents on the outside get dissipated, you know, thermally, that's just fine. That's good. So looking at uh, the bead, so this bead right here will fit over that 087 uh, 086 diameter coax with a pretty tight fit. It doesn't need to be perfectly tight, but you know you you want to you don't want it kind of rattling around on there. And looking the impedance to this up at a gigahertz, it goes up to about uh, oh uh, 200 ohms. So this should be a decent bead to put along the outside of that uh, coax. So I've created an arbitrary 3D EM structure in Analyst. I've created a material called ferrite underscore 61 with a relative permeability of 125 and then just done a uh, extrusion up here, a uh, pipe extrusion with a proper inner and outer diameter and length of that bead uh, that was in the data sheet. And this can be instantiated into, uh, back into the, uh, coac the uh, uh, coupling loop structure. Uh, you can see I've drawn this so it extrudes along the z-axis, so we'll need to rotate this once it goes into the EM structure. So I now I've dropped these beads into the EM structure. They won't show up in the EM schematic since they're arbitrary structures, but uh, without ports on them. But what I've done is uh, I taken take a look at the. Uh, in fact, here's here's the bead by itself. But take a look at the uh, layout of this. You can see I've taken and uh, take the shape properties. I've rotated this around the y-axis by 90 degrees, and the one on the left side is coming in at EM layer four. Uh, that's why it was important to make that when you draw it back in the arbitrary uh, 3D editor to uh, draw it on the, you know, with one of the uh, points at the origin so it can be uh, brought in properly on the uh, layers. So anyway, I've added one right here and I've added another one right here, but this one is brought in on EM layer 2. And when you zoom in on here, you can see that uh, they are aligned, you know, perfectly around the uh, coax. So now this can be simulated and compared to the model without the beads. And what I did is I just copied that coax, a uh, couple loops coax analyst, just copied that structure over, create a new one, and then dropped in the beads on this one. So I simulated the bead now. Uh, the blue line is the original loop without the coax attachment, and it was down at uh, minus 50 dB of coupling. Adding the coax brings it up to probably about minus 32, it looks like. And then adding the bead drops it down by about 15 dB. So this is what we want. Uh, we're killing off some of those common modes on the outside. The issue, though, is that you're seeing this big peak in the coupling right here. That actually may be due to the fact that, uh, you know, I've added this uh, high permeability material on the outside. I didn't add any loss to it though, so this may be acting like a very uh, electrically short resonator uh, as the currents, you know, the fields are flowing through that material, it's gonna electrically shorten it. So uh, I'm gonna add more beads onto here and see if we can uh, move that out of here. Uh, realistically, I need to add a loss tangent into this material, but I'm not sure exactly what that is yet. So. Uh, it's only going to improve when we add loss to this, so let's add more beads and see what happens. So now I've gone and added uh, one, two, three, four, five, six beads on each side of this thing, almost taking up the full 50 millimeter length of the uh, coax. And what's interesting to see if there would be any difference between having the beads butted up against one another or having a slight air gap in there, because you are going to get uh, you know currents flowing inside of this bead, sort of like eddy currents. Uh, so just like when you're doing magnetic shielding, it's preferable to have multiple shields with an air gap between them so the currents can't couple into one another. Uh, so it may be the same way with beads, but uh, I'm going to go ahead and just simulate them with all the beads butted up against one another for probably worst case. So now the red trace is the six beads on each one. You can see that the the uh, response is broader band. Now we've got rid of this uh, peak right here and brought it down. Uh, we're still getting this right here though, so I think it's time to go ahead and build the thing up and see how it uh, how it uh, works. But we've almost brought the coupling down to the, the ideal 50 dB, so let's build it and see what happens. So I remade the fixture. I actually just modified it. I took and used the 086 coax and added a female 
SMA connector on one side and then added a male on the other side. That's just to make the thing insertable so I don't have to you know, use any more adapters. And added six of the ferrite beads on it. And then I took and um, soldered the, removed those connectors. They come off with a large soldering iron quite easily. Added, soldered the coax on the ground pad and then looped the center conductor over to the feed point and then remove the rest of the trace so I don't have a dangling trace. If you look underneath there you can see how it's just kind of jumpered over and did the same thing on the other side. So now we can uh, hook it back up and see if that made any improvement in the isolation at higher frequencies. So the beads have definitely improved the isolation at higher frequencies. Now if I take and previously at 1 gigahertz I had about 20 dB of maximum isolation when this thing was nulled out. Now Assuming that's a null point right there, it looks like I have around 40 dB. The simulation indicated I could get about 45 dB. Uh, running my finger along here, now you can see that I can run my finger along the, the coax back here. It's not affecting the uh, response at all, so the common mode currents have been choked off. Not until I get about uh, right up here, you can see it starts to affect it slightly, but the beads are forming a, a pretty decent ballon to improve the isolation now. Since the isolation has been improved, we should be able to perform higher frequency measurements that previously could not be uh, measured. I've now nulled out the response about as good as it, it's going to get, so about 50 dB down at the uh, about 200 megahertz, and it gets up to about 40 at 1 gigahertz. But I've added the original 180 megahertz resonator back on there, and you can clearly see the response. So now I've added a new resonator on here uh, that consists of a 5.6 picofarad, again, ATC 600S capacitor, and a 5.6 nanohenry uh, Coilcraft 0805 inductor, 0805CS inductor on there. And the resin frequency predicted is about 900 megahertz, and uh, it's being measured about 845 megahertz. So I've... Uh, zoomed in now to 850 megahertz with a span of 100 megahertz on the VNA. Uh, looking at the data sheet, the capacitor has a Q of about 350 and the uh, inductor of 65, so that unloaded Q should be about 55 and a resonant frequency again of 900 megahertz. Uh, looking at the resonant frequency, it's 845 on here, probably tolerancing due to the parts. Uh, and then uh, the bandwidth is approximately move this piece of paper over here the bandwidth is 19.1 megahertz so if you do that calculation you end up with a Q of 44 and that is less than the Q of 55 I've spanned the network analyzer out to 200 megahertz now and uh, you can see that this is my, uh, you know, the, the isolation, the null floor right here is around minus 45 or so. And I think that is actually limiting the Q measurement. I think the Q is actually a little bit better. You know, we predicted predicted 55 and we we're measuring 44. But uh, I think if I could null this out, possibly a little bit more, maybe I'll get, you know, maybe I can't really seem to get a better measurement. That's about the limit of the isolation, so we need more isolation, but previously this measurement could not be made until the ferrite balance were added because the null floor was up around minus 30, and you can see that the resonance peak is around minus 38, so uh, it was definitely masked out, so this fixture works better now. I've recalled the analyzer. I had previously saved the uh, state and trace when it was on the old fixture. So you can see the comparison between the original without any modification and then the new one with the ferrite. So we're gaining about uh, 12 dB of uh, isolation improvement at the high band. Interestingly enough, at the low band, uh, we had a much sharper null, but we also had these resonances in here. So that was probably an effect from the uh, common mode current flowing on the outside of the coax. But it's a much smoother response now. And... Uh, pretty close to what was predicted by the simulator. You know, the simulator has said 45, and we're getting about 45 through this mid-region right here, but it creeps a little bit up a little bit higher at the end. So in conclusion, I think this uh, method is, is pretty slick for measuring the Q of very small surface mount components. Uh, at lower frequencies, you know, down around 1 to 300 megahertz, I could 
possibly get away with measuring a smaller part, say an 0603 and 0402, but I think up at um, higher frequencies around a gigahertz, I'm really limited, again, by the isolation of the fixture. Uh, I don't think we can measure any smaller parts than this 0805 part, but uh, it, it seems to work pretty good for, uh, for doing this work, and again, the whole point of this was to measure the resonator unloaded Q, so when you're building oscillators, you can get a idea of what the phase noise is going to be. Uh, unfortunately, I think I took this course, I think it was in a 2011 uh, IMS conference in Baltimore, but I can't remember, I can't find my class notes to find the guy who taught the thing, but this is a pretty slick method, so hopefully it's been uh, somewhat documented now.